Well, good evening, everyone. My name's John Meter, as Amanda said, and I am the owner and director of Northern Stars Planetarium, a portable planetarium, and I come to the schools in Rangeley, so some of your kids may have been inside my bubble, as they call it. So tonight, we've been doing these star parties all winter long, and I always try to find something fresh to do. So I'm going to do something a little bit different tonight. We're going to talk up. This is a very special time of year for amateur astronomers because the night sky is filled with these things known as Messier objects, named after a guy named Charles Messier. And Charles uh, was a gentleman born in France. Let's uh, bring him up here just for a second. Here he is. And he was born in France in 1730. And um, he, I think he was the 10th of 13 children or 12 children or something like that which was very common back in those days because you lost half your children, unfortunately. But he grew up and became infatuated with the sky. When he was 13 years old, he saw the great six-tailed comet of 1744. Now, comets routinely, when you get a nice bright comet, you can routinely see two tails. There's a broad white colored dust tail because comets are big dirty snowballs that orbit the sun and, and the dust gets left behind and it kind of glows as the sunlight shines on it with a white light. But then there's often a little thin blue tail, and that's the ion tail, the gases that the ice, when it sublimates, turns to a gas and it gets blown away. And, and it gets, uh, when the solar wind goes by it, it ionizes it. So it actually glows a little bit with a blue light. You frequently see those two tails because they'll separate a little bit apart. Well, in 1744, there was this incredible comet. Uh, it's listed as being the sixth brightest comet ever observed in history. So it was incredibly bright. It was visible during the daytime. It was so bright. And, and it had, after it did perihelion, which is the point where it goes closest to the sun, it was described as having six tails, as you can see in this picture. Well, when he was 13, he saw this, and he became totally intrigued with comets. And it just heightened his interest in the night sky. Another, invent, another observation he made, which took place in 1753 on May 6, was the transit of Mercury. Now, Mercury and Venus are between us and the sun, and occasionally they go directly in front of the sun. And this image you see here is an image of the sun that I took on May 9th, 2016. And myself and my friend Larry uh, Burtz, who was planetarium director in northern Maine at that time, he and I joined forces and observed this. And you see Mercury is just this little tiny dot here. And we were using solar telescopes that have proper solar filters so you can observe the sun without you know, burning out your eyeballs because you shouldn't look at the sun without the right filtration. Well, we had that. That's how I got this picture. I'm not sure exactly what Charles Messier had to, to you know, block the sun. He certainly was using a smaller telescope than I have probably, but um, solar filters, I'm not sure exactly what they did, whether you projected it. If you look through a telescope without a filter at the sun, you would be blind in seconds. But he did observe this. That tiny dot is the planet Mercury, and he saw it move, moves across the face of the sun. Well, it really impressed him. But his real fascination was with comets. Now, he saw one of the greatest comets in history. We recently saw one of the greatest comets in history in 2021. That's this comet, Comet Neowise. And I hope some of you got to see it. You see what it looked, this is pretty much what it looked like in the sky. I've got this picture right beside a pine tree, so you can get an idea of how large it actually was in the sky. If you just standing in a spot and looked up without binoculars, without a telescope, this is pretty much what you'd see. The white tail is that dust tail I talked about. And if you look above it, you can see that faint blue hazy line right there. That's the ion or gas tail, as we call it. And down here's the dirty snowball of the mass of the comet itself, the nucleus. Well, he saw one of these bright comets, and then when you see one, it is an amazing sight to see, and he became infatuated with the comets. But as he learned about comets, he learned that most of them don't look like this. Most of them look more like this, this little guy right here. Now, this is a picture I took this winter. Some of you may have heard that we had a comet that made quite a bit of news this winter. It's called the Green Comet. Well, when you take a, a little bit longer exposure, you can start to see the green color. You didn't see it with your eyes. I didn't see it with your eyes. And I saw this comet a dozen times or so. And uh, and it did have a little hint of a tail, but it, you might look at that and go, boy, that's wishful thinking. Lots of comets, you don't see the tail at all unless you take photographs of them. And Messier didn't have the ability to do photography. It didn't exist back when he was alive. He could only observe what he could see with his eyes. 
So he came to realize that most comets are just these fuzzy little patches. The problem he had is that the sky is filled with fuzzy little patches. And so he wanted to catalog the ones that weren't comets. And how do you tell them apart? Well, comets do something that nebulosities don't do. They move. So if you took this picture or you looked at this spot and you saw that comet, and you might wonder, is it a nebula, which is a cloud of gas floating in space that never moves, not in a human lifetime at least, or a comet? Well, the easy way to tell is you come back a night later, tomorrow night this comet might be over here, and two nights later it might be down here, and two nights later down here. It will slowly move through the sky. Well, in the process of doing this, he discovered 13 comets in his lifetime, which is an amazing feat. Discovering comets is a lot of hard work. But in the process of trying to discover all these comets, he cataloged all the fuzzy little patches in the sky. And this is a very famous one and one of the larger ones that you can see. You can see it with just your eyes. It looks like a fuzzy little star. Through a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, it looks like this. It's called the Great Orion Nebula. I'm going to show you what that is in the sky in just a couple of minutes when we get to the, the sky part of the presentation tonight. And this is one of the many objects that he observed and quickly realized it was not a comet because it doesn't move, it doesn't change its shape, it doesn't develop a tail or lose a tail. It stays the same always. When he looked at it, and if you go out with a telescope sometime, and let's say we actually get a star party <laughs> outdoors, and if we look at this with a telescope, it's going to look like this. It look, in, it look like black and white. You won't see much color with your eyes. If you put a camera on that same telescope and take a picture, you'll see color like this. You'll see pink colors, you'll see some blue colors, and you'll see dark areas and white areas. There's lots of color here. With our eyes, it looks more black and white. And that's because the part of our eyes that sees color, the cones, if you remember from junior high school when you studied that, uh, cones let us see color, but they need quite a bit of light to work. If there's not a lot of light, they just kind of shut down. They can't see anything. Luckily for us surrounding the cones, we have another kind of light receptor called rods, and rods can see very faint light, but they can only see in black and white. So when you look at most things in the night sky, like stars mostly look white, don't they? Except for some of the bright ones, you might see color there. Well, because it takes a lot of light to affect the cones. Most stars have color. There are white stars, but no more white ones than red ones or orange ones or yellow ones or blue ones. They all look white because the part of our eyes that sees them can only see in black and white. Nebulas look black and white too, even though they are actually colored. He didn't know about the color, but he did catalog these things. This one became known as M42. This one right here, and see the little spot above it right there? That became M43. Well, he cataloged these things. He drew pictures of someone. This is his picture of M42 and M43 one that he drew himself. So, and they were just fuzzy little patches, which looked a lot like comets to him. So he wanted to know where they all were. So he didn't waste time looking at things, thinking, wondering, is this a comet? If he could catalog them, then if he looked at that spot, he'd know what he was looking at. He might not know what it was, but he'd know it's not a comet. And that's really all he cared about. He didn't care what these things were. He just wanted to know where they were so he wouldn't mistake them as comets. He cataloged 110 of these things. And they're scattered all over the sky, as you can see here. And uh, so these, and these are some of the best objects in the sky to look at with a small backyard telescope. So they're very famous. It's the most famous catalog of deep sky objects. It includes galaxies, and it, it includes uh, globular clusters and open clusters and nebulas and planetary nebulas. And we're going to see some examples of all those tonight. We're going to look at some messier objects. Now, you might wonder, why am I bringing this up now? I mean, we've done star parties here for a couple of years. This is the first time I really brought up the Messier thing. Well, this guy, Don Maschultz, he passed away last year of COVID, unfortunately. I never got to meet him, but he was a comet hunter, too. He lived from 1952 to 2022, and he discovered 12 comets in his life. And he spent tens of thousands of hours staring through the eyepiece, hunting for comets. He was really dedicated. Today, it's harder to do in some ways because we have mechanized machines that are doing uh, sky surveys, automated, and they can pick up comets way before most humans can. Yet he still found 12 while those things are still going on. And if you are the first one to report it, it, the comet gets named after you. So there are at least 12 comets named Comet Macholtz. So if you name a comet, if I named a comet, it'd be Comet Meter. And if you named a comet and your last name is Smith, you'd be Comet Smith. 
And if two people name it on find it on the same night, then it's comet meter Smith and so on up to three people. After that, it's this done. Well, he was interested in, he also was interested in, in Messier and the Messier objects. And they're scattered all over the sky, like we saw. And Don and two of his friends, Tom Hoffelder and Tom Ryland, uh, Ryland, excuse me, realized that the way these were scattered across the sky, that there was one time of the year that if you spent all night long, from sunset to sunrise, you could see all 110 of them. Other times of the year, you couldn't do that because some were only up in the daytime. But the way they're scattered, there's a break. And it turns out it's the last couple of weeks of March, right now. If you have a dark spot, which you do in Rangeley, a nice dark spot, and you don't have a full moon, You the moon makes faint things hard to see, so you want to do this around a time when there aren't any, when there's no bright moon in the sky. A lot of things you got to think about, but if you get a dark spot where you can see the whole sky, you know, go on top of Quill Hill or someplace like that, uh, that potentially, if the night cooperates, you could look at all 110 from sun you have to start at sunset and you'll finish just at sunrise and it also means you need to coordinate like when can you do this you know most of us have to work and you don't want to stay up all night long and then have to go to work at eight o'clock the next day so there's all kinds of variables the weather has to work the moon cycle has to work your work cycle has to work and you're going to be in a nice dark spot and for a lot of people who live in urban areas that's a, that's an issue you don't have that if you live in Rangeley because you've got great dark skies there so it'd be a great place to do what's called a uh, um, uh, Messier marathon, and uh, I have yet to do a Messier marathon. I would love to try to do one sometime. And today, there are lots of books that can help you plan your Messier mar marathon. You've got to do them in the right order. You can't, you know, you got to start because some are going to set soon after sunset. You got to grab them quick, and and get through all 110 of them. So there are all these books that can help you learn about the objects, learn how to plan your marathon. There are websites you can go to. There's there's a whole community out there of people who are just crazy about this stuff. Well, they just they came up with doing this back in the in the 1980s, uh, 19, late 1970s and early 1980s when this first started, and it's really taken off and it's it's quite a spectacular thing to do. And uh, to give you an idea, here's a, a picture of all the Messier objects. I took all these pictures with an automated telescope, not an automated tele it's a remote telescope. It's a telescope in the Canary Islands. And if you join this organization called SLU, S-L-O-O-H, online, SLU.com, uh, it costs $100 a year to join. But you can join and you get to use these four telescopes in the Canary Islands plus three telescopes in Chile. And they're like big observatory type telescopes. And you can plan times set and you can use it every night of the year if you want to. $100 a year you can use it unlimited and take pictures of deep sky objects, pictures of planets, and they have all these quests you can do where one of the quests is catalog, you know, get pictures of all the Messier objects. So me being the geek I am, I had to do that one. And this is my collection of photographs of all the Messier objects that I've seen. I didn't do them all in one night, though. It took me about six months to get all these pictures and get good, nice quality pictures of them. So what we're going to do tonight, I'm going to leave this little PowerPoint and we're going to go to Stellarium, our night sky program here. and. Uh, Come on, there we go. Hopefully you can all see that. If you can't see that, man, the last guy didn't come up, so let me know. Um, this is the sky tonight, minus, you know, sans the stars, no, uh, sans the clouds. I mean, I know it's snowing where you are. It's raining where I am here in Waterville. Um, but if it were clear tonight, this is pretty much what it would look like. And uh, we're looking to the west. And if you've been outside looking to the west, you've seen these two bright objects. They're not Messier objects. Those are the two planets. The bright one on top is Venus. And the one that's getting lower and lower to the horizon, which will disappear soon for the next several months, is the planet Jupiter. So two or three weeks ago, they were within a half a degree of each other. Venus was right beside Jupiter. But Venus being close to the, to the sun moves much faster than Jupiter. And it's moving away. And it's slowly moving along the ecliptic, which is this line right here. Oh, no, I hit the wrong button. This line right here. The, the ecliptic is the path of the sun through the sky. You know, if you, there's always stars behind the sun. You just can't see them because the sun's so bright, but they're always there. 
And if you plot that path through the stars, that's called the ecliptic. And the planets follow it too. And Venus is chasing a planet that's higher in the sky right up here, which is Mars. And Mars is right above Orion the Hunter, which we'll get to in a moment. And they're moving, and Venus moves faster than Mars, so that by the 4th of July, they're going to be way over near Leo the Lion, which we'll also see in a couple of minutes, and they'll be side by side. So back in early March, at the beginning of March, Jupiter and Venus were side by side, and by the 4th of July, Venus will be right next to Mars, and they'll both be way over off the screen for where we are right now, because they're both moving. Well, this is the sky tonight, and uh, let's shut the equator and the ecliptic off. We see those three planets in the sky, Jupiter, Venus, and Mars. But I want to concentrate on moving through some constellations you can see right now and finding some messier objects. Now, there are lots of objects in the sky that aren't messier objects that are beautiful to look at, too. But since this is the time of year for a messier marathon, uh, I thought we would concentrate mainly on those tonight. To give you an idea of how many there are, let's just put the locations of them all up here. So these are all the objects in the sky that are messier objects, things that Charles Messier cataloged as non-comets, things to avoid if you're hunting for comets, because you might confuse them otherwise. And this isn't all of them. That's just this, the, the, the bright ones around the southern sky right now. As a matter of fact, if you zoomed in, like if we look at Orion the hunter here, well, let's click on Orion. There he is. You'd find that M40, it only shows M42. Well, the program's such that the fainter ones only show up when you get in closer. So if you zoom in close, remember I showed you M42 and how it was right next to M43? There they are, right there. And if we go above Orion's belt, there's M78. M78 is much fainter than the great Orion Nebula. So they make it disappear when you zoom back out while they keep the Orion Nebula here. So there's a few more than what we see. We're just seeing some of the brighter ones labeled here. If you zoom in, you'll find there are even more. And of course, there's 110 of them all across the sky, and they go all the way around right through the summer and fall and winter. So let's kind of go through our winter sky a little bit. And as we do, we'll look at some of these objects and learn a little bit about them. So we've got Orion up here. So let's just start with Orion the Hunter. Great wintertime constellation, high in the southern sky. And it actually stays up to about halfway through the spring, almost to the 1st of May before it disappears. And then it won't appear in the evening sky again until after Thanksgiving sometime. I mean, if you get up 4 o'clock in the morning, you can see it in September. But for most of us, we do most of our observing the average person in the evening after dinner. And so that time of year, we see Orion from around just before Christmas through to the end of April. So it's still visible right now, very clearly. And uh, to see Orion, we get the three stars in a row for his belt with a leg here and a leg here. I don't like to put a line between his feet because I think he would trip and fall down. So, But you'll find different programs draw him differently. Above his belt, he's got a body. And I usually draw a line between his two shoulders and then just a little line going up to these three stars for his head. Then we've got an arm with a club and an arm over here with a shield. At least I draw it as a shield. Sometimes you might have the shield coming up all the way like this if you want. You'll find that there are lots of different ways if you have of drawing constellations. They always use the right stars, but they might connect the dots differently. Officially speaking, uh, Orion is designated by this boundary. All the stars within this rec red uh, polygon are the stars that make up Orion. And as far as astronomers con are concerned, you can draw the lines any way you want, uh, just whatever makes sense to you. So there's no right or wrong way to do that. The sky is divided up into all these strange polygons, and each one is a constellation. So this one here is Orion the Hunter. And we often draw him like this, or sometimes you'll see him drawn like this. And that shield that I draw, sometimes is, you'll see it drawn as a shield, sometimes is the skin of a lion, because there's a story about Orion slaying a lion. And sometimes um, it's drawn as a bow, like a bow and arrow, because it kind of looks like that too. I know when I was a kid, I had a book on constellations. I probably told the story before, but uh, National Geographic book. And I wanted to learn the constellations so bad. And all I had was pictures like this, which I thought were really cool. But when I went outdoors and took that book out, looked at it with a flashlight, looked up in the sky, I couldn't even begin to see stuff like this. I couldn't connect the dots at all. And it was years later that I went found a book that didn't draw pictures like this. 
it drew pictures like this. And suddenly it started to make sense because I knew how to do dot to dots. And that's what constellations really are. So when you find Orion, you want to go down and look at that Orion Nebula. That's probably the, one of the most famous nebulas in the sky, certainly this time of the year. And yeah, let's shut the label off so we can see it. So what is this? A nebula is a big cloud of gas floating in space. Something that's nebulous is cloud-like. Now, remember, when they first saw these 200 years ago, 300 years ago with early telescopes, they didn't see any colors, all just grays and whites. So it does look much more cloud-like. Photography shows us the color. And that color is real. And it is there. It's just our eyes aren't good enough to see it. And it tells us something. Where you see the red, this whole thing, first of all, is all hydrogen gas, which is what stars are made of. Where it's red, the hydrogen gas is being stimulated by nearby young hot stars. Because what stars are made of hydrogen, and this cloud is shrinking and collapsing and forming new stars. This is a region where stars are being born. And there are a bunch of really young stars right in here. And when a star starts to shine and it's really young and hot, it's giving off lots of ultraviolet light. And ultraviolet light has more energy than visible light. It's what gives you a sunburn. Well, it excites the hydrogen and makes it glow with the red light. Now, the, the part that looks kind of bluish here around the edges and up in here, that's the same gas. It's hydrogen. But there's not those young stars nearby. There's not enough energy to make the hydrogen glow. But there are stars close enough by to light it up, like shining a flashlight on it. So it's being lit up by the stars, but it's not actually emitting light itself. So the red is what we call an emission nebula because the gas is actually glowing and emitting light. Whereas the blue is a reflection nebula. Nearby stars are simply lighting it up. And then in between this dark region, that's not like where there isn't anything. There's gas there too. You can see it kind of looks like dark clouds. Well, they are. They're dark clouds of dust and gas that's much cooler. And that's called an absorption nebula. It's absorbing the light that comes through. It's blocking the light from nebulosity behind it. So there are three types of nebulas. There's emission nebulas, which tend to glow red. There's uh, em reflection nebulas, which tend to glow blue, and absorption nebulas, which absorb the light and block it. And we're seeing all three mixed together here. Now, well, the last thing I'll tell you about this is that it's big. From one side here to the other side is about 40 light years across. 40 light years, a light year is the distance a beam of light will travel in a year's time. And light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So if you could travel at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, that's like seven and a half times around the earth in one second. It's pretty fast. Go in a straight line for one year, you'd cover one light year. That's a long way. One side of this to the other is 40 light years across. It's huge. And it's shrinking and forming stars. If you could come back in 100 million years, it wouldn't be there anymore. There'd be a whole bunch of young teenage stars. Well, that's M42 and M43, the little one right above it. Well, if that's the case, and that's a place where stars are being born, we've got another great Messier object, which is in a nearby constellation called Taurus the Bull. To see Taurus, draw a line up through Orion's belt, and it points you roughly to the bright star Aldebaran, which is the eye of the bull. So imagine this is the bull's eye. This V shape right here is his mouth, perhaps. Kids always want there to be two eyes, so I always use this for the other eye. And he's fighting with Orion, so maybe he's got a black eye, so one's not quite as bright as the other. So we've got the two eyes, and this little triangle could be his mouth. And bulls have big horns above their heads. So go above his eye, and it's one horn up to here, and another horn up to here. Then his back, the back of his neck comes down, and with his back here to this little clump of stars. Belly comes up here like this, so this is his body in here. And he's got two front legs coming down, one there and one there. Now, they don't draw him quite like I do. They only give him one leg, and I think that's a very obvious second leg right there. So at least you could give him another leg. And you can also draw a line over through these stars and give them a belly, too, if you want to. It makes a little bit better bull, in my opinion. But you can see Orion the, is fighting the bull. The bull's charging at Orion. His horns are kind of down. Orion's got his shield up and his club ready to fight with him. And they're fighting over this little clump of stars right here. This is another Messier object. It is M45, better known as the Seven Sisters or the Pleiades. Now, if you have a pair of binoculars, and really, this is an object that you can see better with binoculars than you will with a telescope. 
Now, there aren't a lot of things you can say that with telescopes usually improve the view because they gather more light. But this is a big object. You know, with the average telescope, you're going to see an area about this big around. You can see parts of it, but you can't see the whole thing because they're looking at a narrow part of the sky. Binoculars look at a wider part of the sky. In a pair of binoculars, you can see all these stars in one view. And it really looks like a pile of diamonds, much more so than in this, this program, which looks like a little bunch of paper dots, you know, clipped out onto a filthy black background. But when your binoculars, they look like pinpoints that are bright and sparkly like diamonds. It's beautiful. What's cool is if you take a picture of them, then you actually see some nebulosity around them. Now, we know that if you'd been around uh, maybe 150 million years ago, and for us, that sounds like a long time, but for stars, that's like going from being, you know, a baby to a middle school kid. These like middle school kids. And 150 years ago, they were babies or they were pre-babies. They were nebulas like the Orion Nebula. And there's some speculation whether this nebulosity is part of the nebula they form from. And there's some, some evidence to suggest that it's actually part of a different nebula that's between us and them. But nevertheless, it makes a beautiful picture to have all that nebulosity around all those stars. So that's Messier's uh, 45th object. And remember, the, uh, the Orion Nebula is number 42 and 43. So we got a place where stars are being born, and we got a teenage stars over here. Now, if we go down through Orion's belt the other way, we come down to Sirius, which is the brightest star in the sky, this one right here. And that's a middle-aged star. So we've gone from places where stars are being born to teenage stars. Now we got a mature star, like our sun is a middle-aged star. And so is Sirius. Sirius is the brightest star, not because it's super bright or anything, but because it's relatively nearby. I think it's like eight or nine light years away. I could be off on that a little bit. I'm pulling that out of my head. But it's fairly close. It's, there's stars that are, are very bright too, but they're much further away and they're bright because they're really powerful. So Sirius is an example of a middle-aged star. It's in the constellation of Canis Major, the great dog. To see the dog, think of Sirius as the dog's collar. And then we've got this little triangle-shaped head with his nose out here, a body, and two front legs, two back legs, a little mismatch, but that's you have to deal with what stars are there, right? And then we got a tail coming out over here. Now, this star here, his name is Adhara, and Adhara, to me, is a fascinating star uh, because if you could see ultraviolet light, and remember, ultraviolet light is a, more, a higher energy type of light than purple or blue. Remember, the spectrum goes red, orange, yellow, a green, blue, and then to ultra and purple, and then ultraviolet light or violet and ultraviolet light, and then beyond ultraviolet, you get the X rays and then the gamma rays, and so it gets shorter and shorter wavelengths, which carry more and more light. Well, this star is actually brighter than Sirius, and if you could see an ultraviolet light, this would be the brightest star in the sky. Bumblebees and insects can see UV light; they have eyes that can see it. So when they go stargazing, if they ever do that. To them, this would be the brightest star they could see in the sky. Well, for us, we're limited to what we can see with visible light. And in visible light, this one's brighter. This one's bigger, more powerful, giving off higher energy light. It's just a type of light we can't see. And right underneath Sirius, right about in here, is one of my favorite open clusters. Like the Pleiades is an open cluster. This one's called M41, Messier's 41st object. And it's just a little clump of stars, which is what open clusters are. They're young stars. And M41 was one of the first clusters that I actually discovered myself, for myself with a telescope. I wasn't the one to discover it, of course. Uh, it was been seen many, many times before me. But it was one of the first things that I found with my when I first got a telescope way back in the 1970s. And I just happened upon it because I was looking at Sirius and started glancing around. And I just happened upon this thing. And I got... So excited because it was really pretty and I didn't know it was there until I found it in the telescope. And so it's always been one of my favorites. Uh, it's called Aristotle's Star Cluster or the Little Beehive. And it's called Aristotle's Star Cluster because with your eyes alone, without a telescope, you can just barely make out that there's something here a little fuzzy, a little bit different than all these individual stars. And Aristotle wrote about seeing this, this fuzzy object below Sirius. So the cluster is now named after him. This one's older than the Pleiades. The Pleiades are about 100 million years old. 
And this one's about 190 million years old, so it's twice as old. But it's also uh, quite a bit further away. This one has a distance of 25 light years. And I forget how far away the Pleiades are. Um, I think they're, they're uh, a little bit closer than that, though. So, yeah, this one's... No, this is 25 light years in diameter. It's further away. This 2,400 light years away. The Pleiades are... I didn't think those numbers hit right. This is 2,400 light years away. And the Pleiades, I think, are about 1,100 or so. Um, quite a bit, about half the distance. So it's it's kind of a neat little cluster. The same sort of thing, though. Relatively young stars as stars go. So we've we've gone from baby stars to teenage stars to like from you know the Pleiades kind of like middle school stars. These are more like teenage stars, a little bit older. They're about ready to graduate. Then we got to middle aged stars like Sirius. Come up here and we come to Betelgeuse, the shoulder of Orion. Now that's a star that's ready to die, but it's not old. It's younger than the Pleiades. It's only ten million years old, and we know it's going to die. Well, the thing with stars is stars that are smaller, like our sun, which might seem big since it's a million times bigger than the Earth, for stars, that's an average size star. Stars like that will last 10 billion years. That's a long time. But if you're a star that's much, let's say, 10 times more massive, if it's more massive, it's got more fuel and it's got more weight and it burns the fuel so fast that they live really hard, shine really bright, and they die really young. And that's what this red star is, a star named Betelgeuse, an Orion shoulder. It's red because it's a red supergiant. It's only 10 million years old. Remember, the Pleiades, which I said were like middle school kids, are 100 million years old. So this is like a really young star, but it's going to explode one day. And that could be any time between tomorrow or tonight and maybe a million years from now, which in a star's life isn't very long, though it's a tenth of this star's life. So this star started off much smaller and very bright and probably very blue, and it burns fuel ferociously. And now as it gets old, it swells up. And this star is so big that if the sun were the size of a beach ball, so imagine the sun's the size of a beach ball. The sun's a million times bigger than the Earth. Bring Betelgeuse over, it would be a quarter mile in diameter. It is immense. It's a huge star. Last year, it dimmed significantly because it's kind of burping out gases and dust and it made it dim down and people speculate is he getting ready to blow it's 800 years away so when it explodes it's not going to hurt us but it was when it does explode it will be the brightest thing in the sky other than the sun they say it might be as bright as the full moon though it'll still just be a pinpoint in space so bright that at night if it's in the sky when it does explode you could read a book by it it'll be bright Imagine that, a little star. So how do we know that? Well, come up to the tip of Orion's club and then hop over the tip of Taurus the bull. And right about in there, we're going to find another messier object, one that's really fascinating. Let's see if I got even close to it here. There it is, not too far off, right here. This is M1, Messier's, Messier's first object that he labeled, right here. And it's called the Crab Nebula. And you see it has that nebulosity look of this. It's a cloud. And, but this one's not shrinking to form stars like the Orion Nebula. This is a star that exploded. And we know exactly when it exploded. It exploded on the 4th of July in 1054 AD, about 1,050 years ago. And uh, this is the first object that Messier um, cataloged. I'm not sure exactly why, but... It's, it's much smaller than the Orion Nebula, but you, it's not hard to see because it's relatively bright for its size. And um, it's 6,500 light years away. This, the Chinese wrote about this. They call it the guest star because this star just suddenly appeared in the sky. Then they wrote that you could see it in the daytime uh, for about 23 days. And then it faded from view from the daytime and it was visible at nighttime as a very bright star for uh, maybe three or four months, and then it slowly faded away and disappeared. It was like a guest. It came, it stayed for a while, then it went away. Well, it's still there, but you need a telescope to see it now. And uh, we know that this is an exploding star, and we can tell the difference by looking at the spectrum of the star. So you know how we look through a telescope and we look at this object, and we see this beautiful thing, and we try to appreciate all the subtleties and all the little uh, nuances to it. 
But to learn about it, what the scientists would do is they put a prism instead of an eyepiece, let the light go through the prism, which creates a rainbow, which scientists call a spectrum. What does the spectrum of star look like? What does the spectrum of this look like? Well, if you looked at the spectrum of the Orion Nebula, where stars are being born, you'd find two or three black lines going through it, where certain wavelengths of light are missing. Well, it turns out that's caused by hydrogen. Hydrogen always absorbs two or three very specific wavelengths, and we've learned that that's a signature for hydrogen. If there's a lot of helium there, then you might get a little hydrogen in a couple lines that are the lines specific for helium. And you can find that all these different gases, when they're, they're glowing and they're energetic, they absorb different wavelengths of light. And the spectrum, the more wavelengths you, the more these black lines called absorption lines in the spectrum, the heavier elements you find. And when a star explodes, it creates the heaviest elements of all. It creates everything heavier than iron, everything denser than iron. And so what we find is there's the lines of gold in here, and there's silver in here, there's platinum and uranium, there's everything in here heavier than iron. This is where it's created. Everything that's heavier than iron, gold, think about gold and silver. If you have a gold ring on your finger right now, or a silver earring in your ear, all the gold on the planet Earth, all the silver on the planet Earth was created when a star exploded. You have a piece of a supernova on your body right now. Isn't that cool to think about? I think it's really cool. It was created in an object just like this. And we know that by studying the spectrum of these objects. And so M1, the Crab Nebula, it's just a spectacular object and it's changing. If you look at pictures taken today and then pictures taken 50 years ago, they would look slightly different. You could see how the thing has expanded. This is still expanding outwards at a thousand miles per second in every direction. And this is what it looks like after a thousand years. So it's getting bigger and it will get fainter as it gets bigger. So that's a really interesting object in the sky. And that's right up by Taurus the bull. So we found a couple of really cool things right around Orion and Taurus and Canis Major, the big dog, right up in the southern sky. So here we have the mighty Orion. We got baby stars and the sword. We got Middle school stars over here in the back of right on the back of Taurus the bull. Underneath the collar of the dog, we find some teenage stars. We find some middle aged stars in Sirius, a dying young star in the shoulder of Orion, and a very dead star up here between the stars of Taurus the bull. And Messier cataloged them all. I think that's pretty cool. Now, let's turn our attention and move towards the east. Over here in the east, it's almost spring. The first day of spring comes next week. And you, if you know the stars, you'd know that's on its way because we have a great springtime constellation coming up in the east now. It's called Leo the Lion. It's right here. To see Leo, you want to look for this little half circle in the sky. And if you look at the half circle, there's a bright dot underneath it. Let's take the, let's, let's take the lines down for just a second. See this half circle? Let me get rid of the, the marker here too. So... Here is the nice half circle with the dot. Kind of looks like a question mark, right? Only it's facing the wrong way. This is known as the backwards question mark. Curls around and comes down with the dot. So the question is, how do you take a backwards question mark and turn it into Leo the lion? Well, obviously you do it by adding a few stars. So let's add a few stars. The backwards question mark, the curve is the mane of the lion, the big furry mane. And then you just pretend to come around this side for his face. His face is here where there aren't any stars. You kind of have to pretend that part. Then we add this rectangle for a body. Regulus, the brightest star in Leo, is often referred to as his heart. And then we've got a tail back here to Denobla. Now he has legs too, and they don't draw him here, but I'll draw him for you. So come up the bottom of his body, and he's got a front leg here and a front leg out here. Come back his belly, there's a hind leg here and another hind leg there. Well, as we look in this direction to Leo and just to the east of Leo, we're looking at a region of the sky that's rich with galaxies. This is called the Virgo supercluster of galaxies, and there are thousands of galaxies here. And they're not all cataloged by Messier, but some of them are. And two of my favorite ones are right by his hind leg. And they're not listed on here, but they are Messier objects. And there's actually three galaxies. And Messier only cataloged two of three. But when you look with a backyard telescope, you can look, see all three in one view. 
just go down Leo's hind leg and just behind it, you're going to see three smudges of light. They're right in here. Let's go in closer so you can see them even better. This is called the Leo triplet. Let me get them centered. There we go. Because they're three galaxies very close together. This is M65 and M66. And I'm pretty sure, yeah, M M65 and M66. And they're all spiral galaxies. There are different kinds of galaxies. There are spiral galaxies. There are elliptical galaxies, which is just big, hazy, humongous, humongous groups of stars. And but they don't have any spiral forms. Uh, but these are all spirals. We're looking at them at different angles, and uh, and they're all kind of unique in their own way. Let's look at M65 first. This one right here. Let's center it and zoom in. When you look at this up close, you can see dust lanes going through the galaxy right here. And that haze looks like a cloud, but it's mostly all stars. These things are really, really, really far away. I uh, forget the real distance, the distances here, but you're probably talking 30 or 40 million light years. So it's a long, long ways away, uh, but it's quite a beautiful object. Now come down here. And what I want you to notice, you see the dust lanes, and you can see the haze of the stars and the bright spot in the center. Most galaxies have a giant black hole in the center and, uh, and they are pulling gas and stuff in. And that's what's fi firing the center of galaxies in the most cases. Now, if we go down to M66, we notice it's much more colorful. Look at this spiral. It's got the black hole in the center too. And you're not seeing, the black hole's not giving off light. It's the material swirling around it giving off the light. But what I want you to notice is all these pink patches. Remember the pink we saw in the Orion Nebula? I said it was, a, was hydrogen gas glowing as an emission nebula. These are emission nebulas within this galaxy. And emission nebulas get stimulated when galaxies interact with each other. If the galaxy is not interacting, over time, these things turn into stars and they just kind of go away. That's what happened in M65. Here, though, we've got all kinds of emission, uh, emission nebulas scattered around. And what they think this galaxy interacted with is the galaxy that's not part of the, uh, the Messier catalog, this one right above it here, which is called the Hamburger Galaxy, because someone thought it looked like a hamburger. And it kind of does edge on, I guess, where you get the dark dust lanes going through the middle, which kind of looks like your patty of meat edge on, and then the, the buns on top and bottom, I guess. There's, there's pretty, quite a bit of evidence that these two galaxies collided with each other and kind of went either close to each other and disturbed each other. And when they do that, they stir up the gases, like stirring up the pot, so to speak. And it, as the gases stir up, they start interacting and it creates these active star forming regions like we see in M66 down here. So these two interactions created all that. And this one probably has quite a bit of it too, if you could fly above it and look down. This one didn't interact. And so the star forming, forming regions has dispersed into stars and it's not as active as it might be as if it interacted with another galaxy. So we can see these three spirals, all kind of at different angles. This one's a little more face on, not exactly face on, but fairly close. This one's at about a 45 degree angle and this one's pretty much edge on. And with the backyard telescope, you can see all three together. You won't see quite this level of detail, but you'll still see them in the sky and they're pretty easy to find because all you got to do is if you can find Leo and find that back leg right there. We've got one back leg here and one right there. Go halfway down that leg and look just a little to the left and they're right there. Easy peasy. You can find it no problem at all. And it's right in the great springtime constellation of Leo the lion. Now, if you have a hard time finding Leo, here's the trick. Most people can find the Big Dipper. Do you see the Big Dipper over here in the Northeast? We've got three stars for a curved handle and four stars for the pot of the bowl, right? I find most people, if they can't find anything else, they can at least go out at night and find the Big Dipper. The Big Dipper technically is part of Ursa Major, the Great Bear. The Dipper is just these seven stars. You can kind of see them hidden in here. I can't draw the lines just on the Dipper, but it's part of the bear with his nose way out in front and a couple of front legs and a couple of back legs here. Pretty weird looking bear. And the, the handle's the bear's long tail, which as you know, real bears don't have long tails, but the one in the sky does. Actually, there are two bears and they both have long tails. So you can imagine them kind of like this if you want to make a, a nice, you know, ghostly picture in the sky in your mind, at least. 
So to find Leo, all you got to do though, don't worry about the bear, excuse me, just find that Big Dipper. Once you find the Big Dipper, imagine if you could grab it by the handle, take that pot and bang it down and you'll hit Leo right smack in the back of the head. If you do that, you can always find Leo the lion. He doesn't mind at all. I just always tell kids, don't take pots and pans to the zoo and pick on the real lions because they're not so fond of it. So here we find the Big Dipper and right under it is Leo the lion. That works in the spring and summer when Leo's in the sky. Now the Big Dipper is up here round, and if you if you bang it down, Leo's still right underneath it. The problem is that time of year, Leo's going to be below the horizon. So you'll hit the ground before you hit Leo. But right now, from now through till the middle of July, you'll be able to see Leo in the sky just fine. It's going to be right underneath that Big Dipper. Now, once you're at the Big Dipper, we find a couple more interesting messier objects. Go underneath the Big Dipper right here. Now, we saw a star recently, just a minute ago, the Crab Nebula, which was a star that exploded. Our sun will never explode. Only giant stars explode. Betelgeuse will explode. These stars that live hard and die young, they when they get old, they just blow themselves to bits and supernova. Stars that live a long time, like the sun, they're smaller. They burn the fuel at not nearly as ferocious a rate. And when they die, they do go through some death rows, but they don't explode. There's an example of one of those right under the Big Dipper. So go to the bottom of the pot, the side you'd put on the stove if it were a cooking pot. And this is Merrick, the star right here. Go to Merrick and look just underneath the pot from Merrick, right about in here. And you're going to see, let's get it centered here, a star that was once a star similar to our sun that died. And we're close to it. Let me unclick that star. And what you want to look for in this part of the sky is look for a, what looks like a star, because this is a very small object, but you might see it looks kind of blue here. And with a telescope, sometimes you can see a little hint of blue color because this is a little more concentrated. As we zoom in, you see it better. And you see it's definitely not a star. It's called the Owl Nebula. Now, the Owl Nebula is what type of nebula, another type of nebula we call a planetary nebula. And planetary nebulas are always round like this. So when they were first discovered 250 years ago, People were hunting for planets in the sky. In 18, uh, 1781, William Herschel discovered Uranus and named it George after King George of England. Well, that name didn't hold, but, but once they found another planet, people went nuts trying to find more. And they found these round objects in the sky and thought they might be distant planets. They're not distant planets, they're nebulas. Uh, but they became known as planetary nebulas because they kind of resemble planets. They're really stars that are middle-sized stars like our sun that have died. And when stars like our sun die, they go through, they swell up and they shrink a couple of times. And then finally, the nuclear fusion starts happening, not in the core anymore, but in shells around the core. And the fusion starts happening, not in the core, but far enough out that when once the fusion starts that far out, it pushes the outer layers of the star away. Not in a giant explosion, they just go drifting off. And making a shell that expands outwards, not at a thousand miles a second, like the Crab Nebula, but maybe a thousand miles an hour, which is still pretty fast, but not nearly the speed of a thousand miles per second. And it creates something that looks like this. So when our sun dies, it will create something like this too. Don't worry, our sun's not going to die for at least four to five billion years. So we got a couple of years to prepare for it. But this is one called the Owl Nebula. And it's got its name because of these two dark areas here, giving like the eyes of an owl. Uh, this is uh, 1,300 light years away, and uh, it's five times bigger than Jupiter appears in the sky, but its surface area is a lot dimmer, so you've got to work a little harder to see it. So you can see why people would confuse it for a planet, because it's as big in the sky as the planets would be. And it was named the Owl Nebula by uh, Lord Rossi in 1848 when he viewed it through a 72-inch telescope. And uh, finally, we could start to see some of the detail like we're seeing here. It's about 6,000 years old. So this exploded about 6,000 years ago, or it didn't explode. It, it ran through its cycles and, and blew off its outer layers. And what's kind of cool is this, is, this one's called M M97. So it's Messier's 97th object. But right beside it, we find another galaxy, which in a wide field view, you can see them both in the same field, just like we're doing here. And this one's 
Messier 108. It's an edge on spiral, very much like the hamburger galaxy. But this is another one. This one's uh, edge on, it's 110 light years in diameter from side to side. So it's similar in size, perhaps. Um, no, that's not right. It can't be 110 light years. They're bigger than that. Must be uh, 110,000 light years in diameter. Because our, our Milky Way is about 100,000 light years in diameter. So it, it's it's another galaxy, and we're looking kind of edge on. Now, it, you've seen two or three of these galaxies at funny angles, so I thought it might be fun to see a galaxy that we're looking straight down at. Because galaxies are shaped like plates or frisbees. They're round, but they're sort of flat, and we're seeing them edge on with all these views. While we're at the Big Dipper, we can find a great face-on galaxy. Uh, this is M101, the pinwheel galaxy. And so go to the handle of the Big Dipper. You can see the handle right here. And between the last two stars, draw a line up and make a, almost a perfect little triangle right here. And right here, you will find the pinwheel galaxy. And it is one of my favorites. You can see it right here. It has a very low surface area. It looks brighter here than it's going to look in your telescope. But you can see it definitely has really clear spiral arms. So those edge-on ones would be like if you're floating over here and looking this way at it from the side. Here we're above it looking straight down. And so the pinwheel galaxy, this is a very large galaxy. It's 170,000 light years in diameter, much bigger than our Milky Way, about twice the size of the Milky Way. And it's got a trillion stars in it, whereas the Milky Way, our galaxy is believed to have around 400 billion. Now, these numbers all sound big. And uh, I just learned recently a way to understand the difference between a million and a billion and a trillion. Because to kids, when I teach, I teach kids all the time, and a million doesn't sound much different than a billion, which doesn't sound much different than a trillion. So think about this. Put it in seconds. A million seconds is 11 and a half days. Now, that's the length that we can all understand. Even a fourth grade understands 11 and a half days. That's a little over a week. A billion seconds is 31 and a half years. That's a lot longer than 11 days, right? 31 and a half years is a billion. A trillion is 31,000 years. So these numbers are huge. Our, sun, our solar system, our, our galaxy, the Milky Way, has about 400 billion stars. This galaxy has a trillion stars. So it's significantly larger. And you can see the pink areas. Those are uh, emission nebulas where stars are forming. And... Uh, so it's, it's got lots of young stuff going on, a fascinating thing to look at. So that's, that's, and that's Messier uh, M101. So another fascinating Messier object right there above the handle of the Big Dipper. So let's just look back. We see the Big Dipper and we see Leo the Lion. When you find the Big Dipper, go to the back two stars of the pot and draw a line up and it'll point you to Polaris, the North Star right there. And the handle of the little dipper comes back down towards the big dipper with a little pot right there. So we can put some lines on that. So we see the little dipper and the big dipper here. And remember, if you bang the big dipper down, you're going to hit Leo either in the back of the head or in the middle of his back somewhere. Now let's swing all the way around. We're going to come all the way back to the western sky where we started. And over here, we see Jupiter and Saturn. I haven't moved the time. I've kept it the same, like if we're out just glancing around in the sky. And if you were going to do a, a Messier marathon, you'd want to start right after sunset. And you still see a little glow of the sunset there. But you'd want to start in the western sky. And one of the objects or two of the objects you might want to look for are right over in this part of the sky near the constellation of Andromeda the Princess. To find Andromeda, first find Cassiopeia, the W in the sky. See that W right there? It starts here and it goes down, then up, then down, then up. It makes a pretty nice W. That's Cassiopeia, the queen. And Andromeda is her daughter. And this time of year, she looks like she's floating on her head. This is her head here. And I draw a line down to this star and up to this one. Then I come back. And that little triangle is her body. These little stars here are one arm. And these little stars would be the other arm. And her other leg comes down to this star. I wish they drew all those lines on it because it actually kind of makes a dot to dot person pretty well. But for our purposes today, one of the first Mercier objects you want to look for is right above her belt, right about in here. And this is a spectacular object because it's the largest 
galaxy uh apparently apparently large because it's nearby it's only 2.5 million light years away and you can see it with just your eyes if you're in a dark spot and if for you folks who either live in Rangeley or maybe summer in Rangeley or winter in Rangeley so you can ski and snowmobile, uh, you got a great spot to see it from because you have nice dark skies there. And if you go to some place with dark skies, the sky is going to look more like this and much more spectacular. And you can see right above that, you can see this smudge of light right here. Now, without a telescope, it's probably going to look more like that. So that's with your eyes. And when you look at that spot, that's not as far away as the pinwheel galaxy. But the pinwheel galaxy, you cannot see without a telescope. This you can just barely see. It looks like a very faint fuzzy star. Now, if you have a pair of binoculars and you stare at it with the binoculars, it's going to look like this. Definitely an oval fuzzy patch of light. And if you have a telescope, then with a telescope, you get to see it even better. You get to see it looking like this. And if you take a photograph, you get this color. With, with the telescope, you won't see the color unless you take the picture, but then you might get the color. So this is a spiral galaxy. We're looking at it at about a 40 degree angle. Uh, the pinwheel were above looking down this way, and now we're kind of at an angle again. So the, this is the, the Andromeda galaxy. And the Andromeda galaxy, I believe, is M42. I, well, I'm terrible with my M numbers if I'm not cheating here and looking at a chart. But uh, it is a spectacular one. And uh, I'm just double checking here. I think it's M42 or M43. Um, I'm sorry, it's M31. See, there you go. M42 is the Orion Nebula. This is M31. So yeah, see, even I can get mixed up on all these numbers. But this is M31. And the, this little smudge of light right here, this is a companion galaxy. And that's M32. That's M30, and this one over here is a con second companion galaxy, which is M101, and they orbit the Andromeda galaxy. So when you look at this and the light comes into your eyes and you're just using your eyes, it's just that faint smudge of light, you should realize that the light that you're looking at left this galaxy 2,500,000 years ago. So when you look at these objects, especially galaxies, you're looking back in time. You're not seeing it the way it is today. You're seeing it the way it looked This in this case, 2,500,000 years ago. And you can just barely see that with just your eyes as a little fuzzy patch of light. Whereas when you look at the pinwheel galaxy through a telescope, you're looking at something that's 25 million light years away. That's a lot further away. That's, you know, 12 times further away. And uh, it the light that's coming in your eyes through that telescope took 25 million years to get to your eyes. So the things that are farther away, when you look at them, you're actually looking at them further and further back in time. So telescopes not only let you see things in the distance, in lots of ways they're time machines and let you see things in the distant past. And that is something that really fascinates me and fascinates many, many stargazers. So it's part of the fascination of the night sky. So that's our sky here tonight. We've let's just review real quickly. We have Venus here and Jupiter here. They're in Pisces, the fish, and uh, and then we have Andromeda, the galaxy right above it here. Come around to the south, and we find Orion, the mighty hunter here. Let's uh turn on the, the lines here for a second. There's Orion, he's got a shield up because he's fighting with Taurus the bull. And Orion has the birthplace of stars and the sword. And Taurus has some teenage stars riding on the back and a dead star between his horns in the in the Crab Nebula, M1. Come down through Orion's belt, we find his big dog, Canis Major, and the bright star, Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. And under another group of cluster stars, M41, Aristotle's cluster, which is a little bit older cluster. So those would be like your teenage stars. Great high school, if you want to keep that analogy going of people. You might notice that behind the dog right here, this fuzzy patch of light crossing the sky goes all the way across and right through Cassiopeia the Queen, which we saw earlier here. That's our Milky Way galaxy looking at it edge on. Actually, all the stars you see are part of the Milky Way. Uh, you can see things like galaxies that are not 
but with telescopes, but everything else you see and all the nebulas and all the open clusters, they're all in the Milky Way galaxy. So we're just looking into the thickness of it through here. So that's kind of like we looked at the hamburger and we saw we're looking at edge on, just looking edge on into the thickness. When we looked up this way, we're kind of like looking towards the top of the galaxy. We're thinking about that spiral. We're halfway through the thickness. Look above us, we see a few stars above us. That's what we see over here on the left. Look towards the bottom, you see a few beneath us. That's what you see over here on the right. But if you look edge on into the thickness, you see more stars. And that's what you'll see. We're looking right in through here. It's quite beautiful. Now look over in the east and we find our hero, uh, one of my favorite springtime constellations, Leo the lion and the Leo triplet of three galaxies down underneath his back leg here. Above that, we find the Big Dipper, where we found the dead star, the Owl Nebula, M97, which is a star that was like our sun, but has already died, and another spiral galaxy next to it. And then up above the handle of the Big Dipper, we found the pinwheel galaxy, which was our face-on galaxy. So all kinds of interesting things to discover in the sky. Follow the two pointer stars, Merrick and Doobie, up to Polaris, the North Star, and then we find the Little Dipper handing, hanging back down towards the Big Dipper. It always hangs back down towards the Big Dipper. Little Dipper is harder to see because the stars aren't quite so bright. You see how the Big Dipper stands out bright against the background stars? Whereas the stars in the Little Dipper are about the same brightness as the stars in the background. So it kind of blends in and hides. And then we swing back around and we find Cassiopeia, the queen. And underneath her, we find her daughter Andromeda. Oops, right here. And, uh, and the Andromeda galaxy. So I hope that's been uh, enlightening for everybody. We've got three planets, Jupiter, Venus, and Mars up right here between Taurus's horns and all these wonderful constellations and messier objects. And that's just a taste of the 110. There are lots of open clusters, a lot more galaxies, and a lot more nebulas that he catalogs scattered across the sky. So I want to thank you all for, uh, for exploring the sky with me tonight. I hope that was fun and enlightening and entertaining. And I'm hoping that next month, I say this every time, hopefully next month when you have the Dark Sky Week, uh, I think we have a session scheduled. And if it's clear, I'm going to come to Rangeley and we'll be outdoors and see this in the real sky. And I've got my fingers crossed. I'd really like to do that. <laughs> I always love my journeys to Rangeley. It's such a beautiful area. And uh, I'm hoping we can do that in April. Thank you, Amanda. Hi. As am I, John. Uh, thank you again for joining us tonight and thank you for leading us, John. And I have popped in some details on our International Dark Sky Week here in the Ranger Lakes region into our chat. Um, I'll be sending them out to our membership here in the upcoming weeks too. So just keep your eyes open. Um, a couple of things that we're doing, we are partnering with the Range Lakes Regional School for a Dark Sky Poster Contest. We're sponsoring a community-wide Lights Out event. And like John mentioned, hopefully an on-the-ground uh, Dark Sky tour, uh, should we be so lucky. Uh, but until then, if you have any questions, please uh, connect with us, stop by our office, or visit us online at rlht.org. We'd love to hear from you. So, good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget to go stargazing. <laughs>